Okay. Exactly. I asked okay. him at the beginning, did, is there like different types of elementary particles? And he said, no, they're ontologically distinguished, indistinguishable. And now they're saying that they are different types of elementary particles. This is just retarded, bro. But it's fine. Why are you guys even debating this, though? To be honest. He, he so what's called, the debate topic? Uh, the debate topic is whether the law of identity or the classical formulation of the law of identity is true and he's taking the negation. And when debating yeah, what it does because, it mean? What does it mean to debate the law of identity? As in, he's asking whether the logical or the classical formulation of it, which is a no, I know, a I know. You're gonna, you're gonna ask, you're gonna ask whether a biconditional satisfies Leibniz's law. I get that, but I'm asking, what does it mean to debate that? Because presumably, when you debate, uh -huh. you're going to be giving inferences for or against a position, but inferences already require a logic in the background. And so, yeah. already, you need a set of axioms and inference rules to have the debate, but yeah. the set of the axioms is going to include the live identity, unless you're like running some kind of a... Yeah. Modified logic that uses some I don't, I don't know when it's wait like relative identity. What are y'all talking about? So uh, it just doesn't seem like it just doesn't seem like the th it just doesn't seem like the thing that you would debate. It's not the kind I of mean, thing that's like what did, he, what did he tell you? What did he think? What did he tell you the topic was? He told me like there's a debate whether or not biconditionals whether there's an axiom in which a biconditional satisfies Leibniz's law is true or not. Oh. That's what, I that's what he said. said. That's not what, that's not what I said. No, what I said. What I said. I was thought you the said whether the law of identity is true or not, right? No, 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 no. We're di we're the, no, no, no. He's confused. No, no, no. no. He's said... confused about how there are different Holy variations God. of the law of identity. Shut cool. the fuck up, bitch. I'm talking. I'm talking. Shut the fuck up. You're confused right now. Anyways, as I was saying, right, he's confused, and I'm explaining to him how there are different variations. Bro, oh my, what's wrong? You're fucking getting beat up. Shut the fuck up, nigga. No, no, you're confused. Why Why would I let you talk? Let me explain to you. I was mid sentence. I was mid sentence. About hundred different variations of the. Ma, wait, I'm coming, mom. Different like variations of the law of identity. That's all. I think there's some kind of imprecise language going on here because there isn't different variations of what is known as the law of identity. But there are. There is. No, no, no. Wait, wait, wait. There is. But we'll talk to you later. I'll talk to you later. It's fine. Hold on. I'll talk to you later. It's fine. You can leave me here. I need to deal with something with my mom. Yeah, hundred percent, bro. I'll just like. Oh, uh, a guy. Yeah, you can be. You, like can, you can be next. Hold on, you can be next after C. I'll explain. This is law. How do you mean something else? For example, let's just start with um the more classical one, which is like there for all a a equals a, for example. Or do you disagree with that? Or do you think that's all overly like ambiguous or something? Well, I don't think that's strong enough to capture identity. Oh, so you have like a different idea of what identity is how do you pause no it? but no, no what you just posited now is going to apply to the biconditional just to just to like biconditionality that's going to apply to it because biconditional is reflect is reflect uh, like sorry yeah is reflexive symmetrical um so like the point is like even the biconditional is going to be like for all a's i is like um biconditionally uh, equivalent to A. But all A's, I is I conditionally equivalent to A? Yeah. So think about definitions. Yeah, you can go ahead. So, yeah, sure. Yeah, think about definitions. Definitions satisfy this thing. But, yeah, okay, um, I get you. I get what you're saying. Yeah. So, like, um, for example, if you have, like, A and I and they are all indistinguishable, it will still, like, suffice the law of identity. It would satisfy by conditionals, and yeah, so is stronger identity is like a diff is a different relation to by conditional. So basically, all identities are by conditionals, but not all by conditionals are identity. So yeah, yeah, I get what you're saying. So in that case, you can have something like a equals b if there are there's like a, a identity relation between the two, or like a yeah, so like they're indistinguishable from each other. So, like, well, distinguishability is where law of identity kind of, like, becomes relevant mm -hmm. because um, the biconditional, I assume you know what biconditional is. Yeah, um, I know. A biconditional, yeah, yeah. a biconditional is reflexive, symmetrical, and transitive, right? And that's suffices for... Hold on, wait, 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 you cut out, you cut out, wait, wait, you cut out. Can you yeah, please, like, okay. hear from what you said? Sorry. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll repeat. Biconditionals are reflexive, symmetrical, and transitive. So for all, so, like, for all A's, A is biconditionally equivalent to A. 
And that's just a biconditional relation by itself. So that's too weak to satisfy what is known as the law of identity. Usually the way it's presented is, um, so you have something called the uh-huh. uh, the law of Leibniz, also known as indiscernibility oh. of identicals, which yeah, is that for all X, that. for all X and for all Y, um, hey, I for, know what you're talking for about, all, yeah. For, yeah. For all X and for all Y, if X is identical, to y that every yeah, predicate true yeah. of x is going to be true yeah, of yeah, y yeah 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 so it's going to yeah, be that, a biconditional mm-hmm. that satisfies this that's what classical identity is supposed to be so it's both it's like all the three properties reflexive symmetrical and transitive plus it's the case that if two if two um, subjects are identical then every predicate true of one is uh, is going to be true of the other that's what the law of identity is it is classical yeah, formulation. Yeah. yeah, I agree with like formulating it in that way, but we were like talking about the differences in a sense like there's like the one where it's formulated as there exists A such that A equals A, for example, but they never speak about how there's a hypothetical where A can equal B. So I was like, we were talking about something like that actually. So I agree with like um the one that's like formulated in modern logic, which allows for A to equal B if like B is like directly indistinguishable from A, for example. Yeah, that but was the, the, the point that I was making is when you just say for all A's, A, A. Wait, sorry. So my mom, my, mom, my, mom, my, mom, my mom, my mom, my God, this guy's mom has like no chill. Sorry. <laughs> but she, she's <laughs> asking for something. Give me like five no, minutes. No, I was sorry. just, yeah, no, that's fine. You can take your five minutes. Then anybody else Venus. wants to debate? Venus, I would like to talk to you, Loki. I want to prod your brain. Is that wanna, okay with you? All right. Yeah, sure. Let me just start like a new round. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Yeah, I wanted to... Uh, you, you do talk about theism, right? Well, I talk about like lots of things, but like theism is like something I talk about there. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, So, like off the bat... Like I don't, I don't believe in God personally, but I feel like there's like some like compelling reasons too that I might consider like switching over for, unironically. Um, and maybe one of them being is that I, I, I don't know. It seems like really compelling to think about like we we live in like a universe where obviously consciousness exists. We have minds. Conscious minds exist, and and there's probably some explanation for that. And it seems like a really compelling explanation is that there was this uh this kind of uh, great conscious mind of some sort that created us or created the conditions for us uh something along those lines like what do you think about that i don't think that's very compelling um so the problem with Mm. this is that what you're offering is some kind of like an abductive argument but um the thing people don't realize about abductions is not it doesn't suffice to have an explanation because if if you like know the difference between what philosophers call prediction and accommodation, it is predictions that have epistemic import, not accommodations. And so if you just look at like um, consciousness and then you give an explanation in terms of like a, a super consciousness as the cause of that, um, all you've done is like accommodate the data. You haven't like really predicted the data. Uh, I'm a busy. Um, my mom's so, uh, I'd be, so and, really and the problem, and the, problem wanna... with, the problem with like theistic explanations is that um, they're usually that's so good, yeah. there's like usually so much that's going on to get the entailment to mm-hmm. the explanandum, which in this case is like consciousness, that the theory is so loaded that it could never ep- sure. entail anything mm-hmm. else. And if that's the case, then it could never have a novel prediction. And if it could never oh, have no, a novel but... prediction, then it could never be the type of explanation uh-huh. we would consider in abductive reasoning. It would just be a, what we call a just so story. Venus, you forgot so, to mention the really fact quickly, that if I you're know, like uh... taking like... Wait, hold on. Sorry there, folks. Um, Venus, you forgot to mention the fact that you're like, if a thesis is going to give like an abductive case for God's existence. Um, obviously, one of the abductive virtues the atheist can use against the thesis is perhaps like a parsimony appeal. Like majority of these are going to make like some explanatory power appeal, which um, I would say has a lesser epistemic impact than parsimony more specifically. Okay. In some I never said so, any uh, of really that, though. I, I just, I, what I said is... The no, I'm not saying you're saying this, I'm saying that you forgot to mention this. 
Yeah, and also I don't think that like induction is independent of abduction. I just think yeah. induction is a subset uh, of abduction. Really quickly, so I think, because I know, so I don't I know, think like, uh, I know toxic yeah, is. I know toxic yeah, is like yeah. I was gonna say. I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't I, mind. Yeah. yeah. I don't. I don't. I wouldn't mind if you. Uh, I wouldn't mind if you resume your discussion with Toxic because it's rude to interrupt that. But I could. Uh, could we talk about it after maybe? Oh yeah. No. What I was to tell the Toxic kid is that. Um, yeah. Yeah. The problem with the way you presented it is like. Your presentation just presents like one side of an answer, which is that it's reflexive. So when you say for all a a is identical to a, all you're saying is that this identity is reflexive. But that's something true by conditionality as well. Um, but identity is like more than merely reflexive. It's also like transitive. It's also symmetric. And on top of that, it's also the case that like um, for things that satisfy these relations, they have oh they have the same God. extension of predicates. And those are not presented when you merely say for all A's, A's is Ma. identical to A. Still talk to his mom? Yo, know, I think this guy got cucked by his mom again. Okay. <laughs> Until he gets that resolved. Uh, really quickly, uh, Venus. Sorry, I keep having you switch between topics. It's rude of me. <laughs> I, I, I'm, not, I'm not particularly well informed on what you mentioned about the distinction philosophers make between predictions and accommodation. Is crazy so, yeah, so like, imagine like we're looking at like 10 things right now that we want to explain. We can always construe a story that's going to explain all of them. So, like, oh, if your shoes are gone and the cookies in the kitchen are gone as well, we can always say there's, like, fairies that, like, specifically steal shoes and cookies. Mm -hmm. And now we have an explanation for the data. But, but this is not the type of explanation that would even be allowed to compete in a set of explanations in which the best sure. one would have epistemic import. What we want so is, like, explanations that yeah, make I, novel I, I, predictions. I think I get but what the you problem mean, like, is right. the problem with like theistic explanations is that they're kind of like the um, shoe stealing fairies type of explanations. They're not the type of things that even have that would even be in the set of competing explanations because they no, fail what philosophers call like an initial appraisal of the explanation. I understand what you mean now. You're like you're talking about like there's a difference between like. Uh, it, it's kind of similar, it sounds like, to like uh, pointing out the difference between like some kind of correlation and some kind of actual like demonstrable causation. Like that's how. That's, correct. that's, yeah, what that's like sounds. one way to. Okay. That's one way of. I see. Oh, it's not sure. That's like so, a like, close way I, of I think thinking is, about it. Yeah, I think that's a valid point. I think a lot of religions, and that's why I'm not, I'm not very impressed with a lot of religions because they do make these kinds of claims. I'm not, I wouldn't ascribe to any particular religion, even if I did think there was like a greater power that could be described as God. But, like, my kind of thing is, I don't think it's as baseless as what maybe a lot of religions might assume. Because the reason why I think that this kind of uh, argument from consciousness, or that it's probably a conscious being that set up the conditions for our consciousness or whatever, is because that's just something that I observe kind of all over the world, is that conscious entities give rise to new conscious entities. That's like the kind of uh, parent-child dynamic. Uh, it, it's like that seems to make a lot of sense to me. And I'm like, okay... I don't know how exactly this is the case on like a cosmic scale, but if like locally speaking, it seems consciousness emerges from consciousness, I could see it as a very good reason to believe in God. Yeah, so like a lot of these things like kind of like intuitively make sense, but then if you try to analyze them, they don't. But um, the point with like the correlation causation thing, if somebody just sees a correlation and they give a causation as an explanation, that causation could be true. But the point is the co the causation here is just a just so story, unless that causation thing can predict other things that were not factored in when you made the type of explanation. So if you look at like video games, if you look at like video games and violence, you could say that like the video game causes the child to be more violent. But what other prediction mm -hmm. does this make? And if it doesn't make any predictions, then you just have a just so story in your hands. So the gap in the correlation yeah, between two objects is kind of like what determines the lack of credibility and such. Like, for example, if we see that, let's say we have a standard domino and I touch the domino, the domino drops afterwards. There seems to be like a very minuscule gap in correlation. They're like, I'm directly observing like some causation process. But like in the tooth fair example, there seems to be like this explanatory gap, which gives us this intuition to not actually grab our brand, this I should say, as a convincing yeah. explanance for the explanation that's being given. 
Oh, that, I mean, yeah, it's you're not, right. It's not any gap. The, it's more so. Th- well, what's okay. what's interesting is the type of entailments of the exponents, and so the exponents might entail the exponandum, but that's like a necessary condition for an explanation to be in the set of explanations we would look into for theory evaluation. It wouldn't be a sufficient one, and the reason is like another necessary condition is that it makes novel predictions. So if it doesn't make any novel predictions, it might entail the exponentum, but that doesn't suffice for it to be in the set of yeah. considered exponentials. So like, so like, I, so like, I don't even okay. I don't, I'm not sure what a novel prediction in the case of this circumstance would really look like, because like, like it's it doesn't seem very novel to predict that consciousness emerges from consciousness, because that's just a known historical trend. It's more along the lines of I think you made a very good point that intuitively we might believe that video games and violence have some kind of like uh kind of intense correlation with each other such that maybe there is a cause that playing Call of Duty might increase your chances of shooting up a school. The problem is, is that we can actually view that that's not really a trend. It doesn't seem like there's like a, a particular spike based off of violent movies or video games. And we have such a high sample size because millions, if not billions of people are exposed to this content. But like, in, like as opposed to the, the whole consciousness question, billions of people have emerged from conscious entities given some process and that's not to say that the process is the same when it comes to god's relationship with human beings but that there there might be and maybe it's even probable that there is some kind of process of a higher conscious entity giving rise to the conditions of our consciousness it's something more along those lines Uh, yeah so like a novel prediction would be like an observational sentence that wasn't taken into consideration when you constructed the hypothesis but it was not reasonable to think that it was taken into consideration when you constructed the hypothesis. Might you so give me? Some... A, could you give me an? Uh, I might. Be, I might not be understanding. Could you give me like an example, maybe, of uh, a novel prediction we could make that, if fulfilled, would convince you of the existence of God, so, kind of based around this? So I think the problem with theistic explanations is that they can they can't offer novel predictions. But like an example of novel prediction was that like uh, when Einstein. Um, theorized like gravity, um, like his like geometrical theory of gravity, like the general relativity. Um, what it would have factored in is like things like ether, uh, travel, how light travels, special relativity, and so on. But like the movement of celestial bodies, like the perihelion of Mercury, was probably not something that like he factored in when he constructed his theory. Um, but as it turns out, his theory um, um, was more precise in predicting the position of the perihelion of Mercury than Newtonian mechanics were. Um, and so that would have been like novel predictions because the, peri- the, uh, the position of the perihelion of Mercury was not something taken into consideration when constructing the theory. Um, other mm-hmm. things were considered, like the ether and how to unify oh God, special yeah. relativity with, um, with, 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 with with gravitation. Um, right. But then it turns out that this thing is like way more precise at predicting the location of celestial bodies than Newtonian mechanics was. So that was like a novel prediction of GR. And it's once sure. you have those novel predictions, you enter into like the interesting um, set of explanations out of which the best I guess one would have epistemic import. The point is like I theists really never right have now. that. What theists usually do is they look at uh-huh. something like whether it's like fine tuning or moral agency or something else, and they just construct a just so story that you know God has such and such properties and such and such desire. And such and such thing, and they load up so much into their god that it would entail this one thing. But then you ask them from this set of properties, what else is like novel things not taken into consideration that was predicted, and it's like nothing. Sure. So like, um, I guess what I'm really questioning because I, I think I actually agree with you on this. I think even a few minutes earlier I said I don't know if it's possible to give novel predictions regarding this type of topic. But I guess what I'm really interested in is kind of why we've set this threshold of compelling evidence at novel predictions as opposed to kind of uh, creating these lines through trends that we've witnessed for years and years and years among billions of people to kind of make these connections. Because to me, right, I would agree with you, making novel predictions is a high form of evidence. 
perhaps one of the highest forms of evidence, and so it's sufficient to make a compelling argument. But I don't know if it's necessary to make a compelling argument. I kind of want your thoughts yes, on that. I think that. the well, that's going to be like an epistemic constraint. The point is that. Um, mm -hmm. So in science, we don't value the type of um, explanations that are just so stories that don't have novel predictions. Um, now, I don't see why, at least from an epistemic standpoint, why a metaphysical constraint would be lower than that of a scientific one. Um, and so given that these are the types of constraints we put on like scientific hypotheses, I don't, at least from like an empiricist point of view, I don't see why you wouldn't put the same constraints on like metaphysical hypotheses. Um, and once you have such an epistemology, these things are just not that interesting. I don't know. So I guess it really depends on what your goal is, because like you just kind of pointed out, obviously there's a bar for science, and there's different bars of like evidence for different things, like science. It's uh, it's clearly what you've demonstrated in like civil court. It's preponderance of evidence, so 51% compelling, right? Um, as far as this goes, if we have um, as far as this goes, if there's if there's no way to kind of provide <clears throat> these novel predictions and. I wonder if these, uh, if you think there's uh, ways for atheists to provide uh, novel predictions that dispute God's existence. Maybe that's a question we should ask. But if like the the the, the like the realm of theistic debate can't provide these things, then maybe it's not a um, maybe it's not that's not the standard that we should hold it to. Otherwise, if it is the standard we should hold it to, we could just never come to an agreement or or. Uh, or uh, or uh, definitive outcome cutting, but... for this world in the first place. Well, I think you like, can have... I'm going to let Apollo speak, but I'll answer your question about standards afterwards. Sure. Yeah, I'm bad, though. Just letting you know. 